Hello again, everybody. Welcome to Michael's Record Collection, where we talk about great music with the people who make it and the people who love it. I am uh, excited to have back on the show Lee Abraham. Lee, how you doing? Hi, Michael. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, very good. So I wanted to see how your gigs have been going recently. I know you've uh, you've done some solo stuff. I know you you had been out with Galahad. Uh, how did how did the audiences respond to the long goodbye material, and and how are the solo shows going for you? Yeah, really good. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, I've done two gigs with the Lee Abraham Band, um, and yeah, it's been really good. We we played our own gig at a venue here down in the south of the in the south of England, which went very well. And um, we had Peter Jones uh, support us for that, uh, doing nice. one of his solo gigs. And uh, and because Pete also sings lots of tracks for me on my albums, he actually got up on stage and sung uh, one of the songs that we did as well in my set, which was which was a real privilege. That was great. Um, and we also played a festival as well last summer, which was really good. Um, so, yeah, that was a bit of a double header for me because I was there <laughs> playing because I also play guitar for Cosmograph. Um, when Cosmograph go out and play live gigs and Cosmograph were headlining this festival. So I did, uh, it was double bubble for me that day. So I played two sets with two different bands as it were, but yeah. And Galahad as well. Yeah. Galahad's been going really good actually. Um, yeah. Like you say, we released the long goodbye last year, um, which I guess was probably the first album uh, that's been released since myself, since I rejoined and Mark Spencer also rejoined the band as well, where both Mark and I's songwriting contributions were um, included because previous albums, we'd still been working through a, a kind of a song bank that had been built up over the years of old right. material, uh, older material, I should say. And um, yeah, so the long goodbye actually contains songwriting contributions from me and Mark and, and the album's gone down really well. And um, we played a couple of gigs out in Europe earlier in 2024 which was great and um we've just come back from playing a festival in poland as well and uh yeah, that was that was fantastic times great. so yeah sounds like things are going really well and uh that's this is the part where i get mad that i live in the u.s where i don't get to go to all these gigs uh when you got you guys are playing out in europe and um yeah. It's a, you know, we have a, a very large country. It's very expensive to travel, so I don't get to see those. But it sounds like you you guys are um, a very tight-knit prog community over there, uh, playing in each other's bands, opening for each other, being on festival bills together and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. It is very much, uh, and I've always felt that about the prog, the prog scene, really, since I've been heavily involved in the prog scene for over 20 years now. And, um, yeah, yeah, you're right. It is very close-knit, and, um, yeah. Yeah, it's great to be part of it. So we're going to talk about a new Lee Abraham solo album coming out October 21st. Uh, it is Origin of the Storm. Uh, I believe this is going to be on your own Festival Music Records uh, uh, record label. Uh, well, Festival Music is uh, is run by, uh, so the, the, it's a company that has got kind of two two different sides to it. Uh, they have a retail side, which is progrock.co.uk. Mm. where they sell lots and lots of CDs and albums and um, DVDs and vinyls and things. Um, but they also have their own kind of in-house label as well, which is F2 Music. Um, and it's all run by the same guy and his uh, and his family. And, um, yeah, I've been signed to them for a long time now, um, probably 15, 16 years, 17 years maybe even. And, um, yeah, a great, great label to be part of. Again, it's part of that close-knit sort of uk prog scene that we have yeah i guess i'd never put two and two together i never realized that f2 and and um, progrock.co.uk were uh, connected uh so yeah. i appreciate that um this is what your 10th studio album i think yeah i think we're up to about 10 now yeah i'm looking at my wall where i've got a, a <laughs> copy of each uh each cd on that yeah it is number 10 yeah all right, Origin of the Storm, is this a CD-only release, uh, CD and digital? CD and digital for now, yeah. So CDs first. Um, it's a business decision, really, um, just to, uh, you know, if we make physical copies of the album, that's where most of the money has been invested. So we need to get a return on that first. Um, so um, CDs first. Streaming will come later, hopefully before Christmas. And, um, yeah, who knows from there? No plans for vinyl or anything at the moment, but uh, you never know never know all right well we'll keep our, our fingers crossed though this is um uh when did you start this particular studio album and when did you complete it how how long did that process take you 
Um, well, I guess the songs have been written at various times over the last three years, really. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a studio in my house here where all my gear is set up, uh, set up permanently. And um, I can just come up here at any time and, you know, record ideas and get ideas down. Um, so it's not like I'm constrained by... You know, well, we have you know three months to write the album and then three months to record it. You know, I, I, I don't have to work like that really. So, um, I try to make sure that, um, well, certainly for the last probably getting on for ten years now, I've tried to make sure that there's at least something out every year <laughs> from me, which is probably a little bit egotistical. But um, yeah, I did seasons turn in twenty sixteen. Uh, to, uh, Colours in 2017, 2018 was a re-release of Distant Days, 19 was Comatose, uh, 18 was, oh, 18 was almost, uh, sorry, also Seas of Change by Galahad. Mm. Um, but anyway, sorry, what I'm trying to say is, if we fast forward to 2021, when I released Only Human, um, didn't do anything in 22, but there was the Galahad album, The Last Great Adventurer. And then last year, 23, of course, there was The Long Goodbye, another Galahad album. So I've just managed to get another solo album out in 2024 <laughs> before 2024 disappears because it's rapidly disappearing, isn't it? We're into October now. Um, so, but it, the, this this album, Origin of the Storm, came together and was completed uh, really quickly, actually, because I remember I remember chatting. Uh, we, we played, Galahad played at the uh, Prog for Perth Festival, which is held in July here in England. And Galahad headlined that. And I saw the, um, I saw the, the, the CEO, I guess, as a want of a better term of F2 music. He was there and uh, we had a chat and, um, and he said, Oh, how's the album going? And at that point, it was all very kind of, um, I was still waiting for various performances to be finished. Um, stuff wasn't completely mixed yet. I was still unhappy with some of the guitars. Um, so I said, oh, crikey, well, it might be, I might get it out this year if I'm lucky. Um, but then all of a sudden, all the performances came in at more or less the same time. All the vocals suddenly landed from everybody. And um, yeah, we came back from Poland at the end of July, beginning of August. And I just was able to spend the rest of August finishing the album. And then here we are. And then it's just a case then of doing all the admin stuff around, you know, making sure you get the artwork sorted and you get the mastering sorted and you liaise with the record label to make sure that the dates work and all that kind of stuff. And then, yeah. And then before you know it, it's all done. <laughs> well, that's all there is to it. Uh, and you're, you're having to do this um, on the, on the side because you are, you have a regular day job. Yeah, I work for a university here in the UK. Um, yeah, it's a busy role, keeps me busy. Um, I, I also play locally in bar bands, pub bands, as we call them in the UK, um, which is, you know, I'm playing every weekend, really. I'm, I'm playing all the time, you know. If I'm not up here in the studio sort of writing or getting ideas down for Galahad, then I'm out playing in the in the bar band, you know, the weekends. All right, so if I'm in England, I'm, you know, I get a little vacation time, I come over to England, where am I going to see Lee Abraham play in a pub band? <laughs> well i just head for the south coast uh because i live in southampton which is right on the bottom of the uh bottom of the country on the south coast and uh um, we just kind of play all over the south coast really so yeah all right so origin of the storm let's talk about the personnel you do a lot on this record as a you know a, a solo musician your solo album so you do electric and acoustic guitars you do some piano some taurus bass some keyboards you wrote all the music and the lyrics for this. You produced it. You engineered it. You mixed it at uh, Dockside Studio in Hampshire. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, it's this ego trip thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I always used to. Um, I always used to say to oh, it was something that uh, Martin Orford told me. That Martin Orford from IQ he used to play in IQ years ago. Told me this. He said, um, he said, it's all very well you wanting to do everything on your albums, but you're not going to be great at everything. So always make sure that you give the jobs that you're no good at to other people. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm no good at drums. I'm no good at singing. <laughs> I'm no good at singing. Uh, I my, my piano playing is very kind of one handed. It's kind of like, you know, just 
maybe one finger with the other hand you know it's kind of like that um it's certainly not uh it's certainly not fluid in any way so uh yeah piano playing i, I tend to farm out to to, to someone good <laughs> um but um yeah when it comes to sort of you know mixing and and producing and all that kind of stuff um it's just the way that musicians work these days because you know if you go if you roll the clock back sort of 20 30 40 years albums could only be recorded in purpose-built recording studios you know and bands used to go into these recording studios and they would have like you know three four five months you know or if you're Def Leppard three four five years um to 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 record your album and and the record company would in, usually insist of having a producer there and you know to to refine your arrangements and your songs and all that kind of stuff and musicians don't really work like that anymore number one there isn't the budget to do that anymore um but um musicians usually have um setups at home because you know it, just about everything is recorded on computers these days um, so it's easy to have your own setup in a corner of a spare bedroom or, you know, maybe you've got an outbuilding or a shed or something in your garden. <laughs> and um, and you tend to you tend to work in a, in a sort of a, a solitary way, really, you know, just writing and recording your stuff. And you, this term demo is kind of dead now. You don't you don't demo stuff. You actually start to record your ideas and those ideas will end up being on the finished album i mean there's loads of times where i've started to record a song you know you kind of map it all out and you you, you put the guitars and you know some keyboard ideas on there to, to to kind of give a picture of how the song goes but those guitar takes and keyboard takes get kept you know and they end up on the final album you know so um and you kind of mix as you go as well you know when it says an album you know you you some people you'll hear them say, you know, oh, we've recorded everything, so we just need to mix it now. Um, I just tend to, to mix as I go, really, which a lot of bands do as well, you know, as you record. So, yeah, it's a lot. E I find it a lot easier these days. Yeah. So you're telling what I hear you saying is your partner's not letting you have enough space to have a six inch tape machine that you can record. <laughs> in your house. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, Gerald Mulligan is back on drums. I uh, recorded yep. and engineered the drums at River Mist Studio. <clears throat> uh, mm -hmm. Carl Carl Groom uh, mastered this. And you you touched on uh, Pete Jones. Pete Jones from Camel is also, uh, I recently heard about him from Rob Reed because he was on Science uh, recent uh, uh, reissues. Um, he did vocals on tracks two, three, and six. Uh, you also had two other vocalists. Mark Spencer from Galahad doing some vocals on track four. Four, which is uh, isolation disconnection and then uh, mark atkinson on tracks five and seven you also had two bass players you had ken bryant on all but um isolation disconnection and that one was alistair martin tell me about that uh, was this something that he just was handy for that particular uh song or was was uh, ken not available one day or how did that work yeah so um as with the last couple of albums, I've done the bass myself. Um, I have used uh, external bass players before, which is great, you know. Um, but um, I, I've done bass on the last couple of albums myself. But when it came to doing the gigs that we did last year, um, obviously I needed to find... So, so I always use uh, Gerald Mulligan for drums. We've been working together for decades now. Um and for the last sort of 15 years or so, I've been using Rob Arnold for keyboards and piano. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and both of those guys obviously are in the live band. Um, but the live band as such has not played. We played some gigs about 15, 16 years ago, and um, the opportunity never really came along to do any more live gigs. But we've had a bit of a resurgence in live gigs recently, so I needed to find a bass player. And... Um, and the, one of the obvious choices for me was to um, approach the guy who's in my in my cover band, in my bar band, you know, um, because he's always asking about, uh, the, you know, the, the stuff that I record and he's always interested in what I'm doing. And um, he's recently been turned on to prog music, I think by me, probably. <laughs> he's a big fan of mystery. Um, oh, nice. And, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, so I asked, I just asked him at the end of a gig one night, I said, well, you know, do you, do you fancy learning some of the songs, you know, in preparedness for these gigs that we're doing? And he absolutely jumped at the chance. 
And um, so he recorded all the bass parts for the album. But when it came to Isolation Disconnection, he kind of said, do you know what? That's not my style. I'm not because it's a kind of it's a heavier track. It's kind of bordering on on metal, really prog metal. Yeah. And um, he said, that's not really my style. You know, he said, I'm sure you could find a bass player that could do it better justice than I could. So I thought that was very honest of him to say that rather than to just, you know, play it and, you know, maybe not not put in his best performance. You know, I thought it was very honest and refreshing of him to say that. And I was happy, you know, to 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 to, to accept that, you know, and um and Alistair plays in Cosmograph with me. So um, there's the connection there. And uh, Alistair is um, is a really versatile bass player. You know, he um, he plays in Fleetwood Mac tribute bands. He also plays in Muse tribute bands, you know. So he's, um, yeah, he's a full-time professional bass player with lots of different gigs and lots of different um, styles under his belt. And... Um, yeah, so he again he he was only too happy to step in and play bass on that track, and he did a fantastic job, I think. Yeah. Uh, so you touched on this. Rob Arnold also uh, appears on this album, uh, piano and additional keyboards, all but one song, and that's just because you got some guy named Clive Nolan to play keyboard solo on Origin <laughs> of the Storm. Uh, I know that Clive and and Galahad go way back. Uh, what was the yeah. uh, genesis of getting Clive on the record? Um, so the way things work in this in this crazy world of prog is that um, you tend to do favors for people. And um, I did a favor for Clive about a year ago where I provided some vocals. People don't really know me as a vocalist and I'd never regard myself as a vocalist. But he asked me to do some vocals for him um, on a, one of his musicals that he was putting together because, you know, Clive is very much into um into writing and performing musicals these days alongside his uh, prog uh, projects and um yeah it was kind of a it was a kind of a spoken word part but it was also had some singing in there as well and it was part of an ensemble um so there was lots of us doing it um there is a there is a video on youtube somebody put it to uh, uh made a cartoon video to go with this particular piece of music and it's on youtube actually you can find it it's very good it's very very well done the animation um but um yeah so there was lots of people involved in that so pete jones was involved in that john mitchell uh nick barrett from pendragon oh nice uh Stu nicholson from galahad um lots of us uh were, were, were characters in this ensemble thing and um anyway so that was the favor i did for clive um so i just i was chatting to him about something else recently because galahad and myself and galahad guys are going up to Clive's place uh, early next year to to play for, uh, at a festival he's putting on. Um, and another excuse for you to come to England, you see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, and uh, and I said, oh, Clive, I wonder if you could repay the favour that I did for you last year. Uh, would you mind putting some keyboards on this track for me? And uh, of course, he was only too happy to oblige. So yeah, that's how that came about. And that's on the title track. So he did a couple of keyboard solos on the title track for me. Yeah, very nice. Uh, now, was the thing that you did for Clive, was that his Viking thing? I'm trying to think because he's he does so many of these things and he tends to do them in tandem, uh, you know, all at the same time. Yeah, and yeah. I can't, it was uh, the the actual piece that myself and the others were involved in. We were all market traders, okay. um, and um, we were all um, trying to sell things to this uh, to this other character. And it was uh, it was good fun to do actually, really, because we were all, you know, we had various things to sell, and we said, "Oh, how about this? Or how about this?" You know. <laughs> It was uh, like I say, I'll have to I'll have to send you the um the link to the animation that somebody did yeah. for it online. It's really good. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, I know Clive has been staging his Viking thing recently, so that's why it was uh, fresh in my mm. mind. Um, you also have uh, Paul Drew does the first guitar solo on Chalk Hill. Um, mm. we'll talk about that in a, a minute because that I found that interesting. Um, because I know you as a guitar player. Um, and uh, then the images and artwork. By Andy Tillerson. This is the same Andy Tillerson from the Tangent. It is, yeah. Now, how did um, that come about? I didn't even know that Andy did art, and maybe I should have known that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, again, for the last few albums, I've um, I've usually connected up with uh, Robin Armstrong, my friend from Cosmograph, uh, to do artwork again because Robin does artwork uh, as well, and um, 
But I managed to uh, ask Robin about the art. Well, you see, because this is all about this point about everything coming to everything coming to a finish really quickly. And um, and like I say, I got to the stage where I was mastering this album sort of early, se late August, early September. Um, and we'd already agreed the 21st of October date with the record company. And um, and I and I thought, oh, my God, artwork, artwork. Oh, how could I forget artwork? You know. So then I'm 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 frantically contacting Robin to say, can you do me some artwork? Um, and and you know you kind of feel guilty about asking because it's not just a front cover; it's a whole package. Yeah. So it's you know an eight page booklet. It's on body for the CD. It's you know for the rear tray of the CD case. It's rear cover as well, and it's you know. <laughs> and and he said, well, okay, but when do you want it? And I said, well, I want it by the end of September. And he said, absolutely no chance. <laughs> 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 he he said, I'm just, yeah I was, that's it he said i've just got too much on at the moment he's he was uh mixing an album for a band called the round window he was trying to do his own stuff with cosmic get a new cosmograph album up together you know plus other things he has going on in his life and he just said no i can't i can't do it you know if you gave me like a six month lead time i could probably do it but one month not a chance so um again this is coming back to this um close-knit prog community thing um i just sent a few feelers out to a few people and um and one of them being andy because i knew that andy had um been involved I, I, I certainly knew that andy had done um some artwork packages for his own the tangent albums um so but i didn't know that it, if he did artwork for other people um so yeah, various messages went out to a few people, um, and um, and Andy came straight back to me, and uh, we had a chat. We had a we had a video call, uh, similar to what we do, because Andy lives up in Yorkshire, so he's like three hundred miles away from me, <laughs> which I know isn't a lot in US terms, but yeah. believe me, in the UK, he's he's he talks different and everything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> yeah, and. Um, so we had a call and uh, and I said to him, you know, I know it's a big ask, um, but um, but anyway, we, we hammered out the terms and everything and uh, and, he, and he was happy and, um, and and give him his due. Within about two days, he, he had front cover ideas to me and, and I loved them all. So I had to pick one and um, yeah, and, and he just he ran with it. He just he just produced the whole package within about less than two weeks. It was a fantastic turnaround, and wow. um, he was really easy to deal with. Great guy, and um, yeah, that's how that came about. Crazy. All right, so this is seven tracks. Uh, the shortest one is uh, just under four and a half minutes. The longest one is ten and a half minutes. So pretty good lengths um, in terms of you know not not something cr incredibly unwieldy in twenty five minutes, and not something like two minutes pop song, but. The shortest one kicks off the album. It's the title track, Origin of the Storm. And as an instrumental, this seems like a weird question. What was going through your mind when you wrote this song? What was the quote-unquote theme of, of Origin of the Storm? Um, so or the, the actual title, Origin of the Storm, came right at the end, actually, I have to say. Um, um, I'm going to make it sound as though this whole album was just cobbled together in like two weeks. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but again it was um it was as as a musician i always find lyrics come last um so song titles tend, tend to come last the music definitely comes first um so you know i can record you know entire songs which are instrumental and then i think right okay well then i'll fit the words in later and i always leave gaps for words you know so i always write a verse and think right well that's going to be for verse 1 here's the chorus verse 2 all that kind of stuff um when it came to writing origin of the storm um that was originally going to be be part of a of a two part song um so the song that follows it is a song called the same life and originally that was going to be same life part one and then same life part two. Um, but when it came to um, uh, giving the album a name, because obviously Andy, when he was working in the artwork, he said, oh, what's the name of the album? And I said, oh, no, I haven't even thought of one yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then you kind of reflect back on the lyrics of the whole, you know, the rest of the album. And I've got songs on there, which is about the Ukraine 
conflict. I've got songs on there about mental health. I've got songs on there about loneliness. So I kind of thought, well, that all sounds, I know it sounds kind of dark, but that all sounds like there's a storm coming. You know, we've got war, we've got mental health crisis, we've got loneliness. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, all of this stuff, all of this dark stuff all seems to have come about in the, in the last sort of 10 years. When you think back the last 10 years, we've had We've had some fairly crazy things going on in the UK. I know you've had crazy things in America with various people in and out of the White House and and, and then again trying to get back into the White House. Um, and then we've had COVID, obviously, and we've had pandemic and all the all the stuff, not necessarily the pandemic itself, but all the stuff that came along with the pandemic, like people's attitudes and the way people used social media and and the way conspiracy theories all kind of, you know, floated around and all this kind of thing. All of this stuff to me feels like it's all happened in the last decade. You know, you go back previous to the last decade and everything felt, I wouldn't say everything was brilliant and rosy, but everything felt a lot calmer. <laughs> it wasn't quite as hectic and, and feels like you're in the middle of a storm like it does now. So I kind of think to myself, where, where was the origin of all that? Where, where, when did it start? And I kind of, you know, again, I go back to, I mean, there was two completely crazy votes. As far, I, I hate to bring it around to politics, but a lot of people navigate life with these kind of events. But mm -hmm. I, I think about 10 years ago, we had two crazy events in politics. In here in the UK, we had the vote to leave the European Union, which was just a completely bonkers vote. It should never have happened as far as I'm concerned. And in the US... You, you voted to put Mr. Trump into the White House for the first time. So both of those things happened around 10 years ago. Uh, and not to offend anybody, if you've got different political views to me, that's absolutely fine. Um, but to me, both of those decisions felt a little bit questionable. <laughs> um, yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I guess that was the origin of the storm for me, okay. you know. So Origin of the Storm, this is the instrumental Clive plays on it, uh, uh, an opening track that uh, doesn't have any, it kind of serves as, um, it's not a concept album per se, but it kind of serves as a bit of a of an overture. Although again, you know, not necessarily with recurring mm. themes, but that's kind of the, the purpose that it kind of serves going first. And then you have the same life. And I think for me, the, the songs that I've connected with most so far uh, after about a half dozen listens, are the same life and Chalk Hill, the next two albums. Uh, first of all, love Pete Jones's vocals uh, from Camel and Cyan and, and other things. Uh, Pete is fantastic. And uh, thematically, this one is about war and perhaps the perpetual cycle of war. And I was wondering what the catalyst of this was. It sounds like maybe this was the Ukraine uh, uh, song that you were talking about. Yeah, so same life. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of trying to say, um, you know, as a, as a country that's been invaded, as Ukraine has been, um, it, it it must feel like that you've been invaded by absolute demons, you know, absolute you know monsters. But I guess when we when we kind of analyze it, you know, the people who live in Russia, the people who are there in Russia, they're just the same as us, really. They still get up in the morning every day, and they still dress their kids and send their kids or kids off to school. And and then they go to work and then they come home from work and they cook dinner and, and all this kind of, we're kind of leading the same life, you know, but there are just certain, certain people within the authorities within these countries, which make decisions, which end up in actions like the invasion of Ukraine, where you just feel like saying to yourself, well, everybody must be a monster everybody if they're if they're if they're backing this if they're you know and i mean as we know the the regime in russia is is so kind of dictatorial that you know the people probably have got no choice in what is happening over there mm -hmm. um but you know I, I i'm trying i'm i'm not i'm not making a statement as such by saying you know oh these people are just the same as you i'm i'm trying to make sense of it in my own mind i guess by saying mm -hmm they must be the same as us. Surely these people are good people. And it's just a small fraction of the people who happen to be in charge that are the monsters. They're the monsters, not the people who are having the same life as us 
the same people who are getting up every day, raising their kids, going to work, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. Um, Chalk Hill, the other one that I really have, have grown fond of very quickly. Uh, this is a song that seems like it has a, a very reflective theme to it. Is there a such place as Chalk Hill? Is that a real place? So, yeah, when I was a kid, um, as, as, the, as the verse says, down by the railway line. <laughs> so we used to go and play down by uh, the railway track. Uh, it was a disused railway track near where I lived. And, um, yeah, next to it, leading up to the railway track, because it, it kind of went across the hills, across the back of where I lived, and there were certain bridges and stuff which carried this old railway line. Um, and, and, and leading up to these railway tracks were chalk, well, chalk banks, banks of chalk, essentially. Um, but yeah, there was one in particular that we used to ride our bikes up and down and we used to call it Chalk Hill. And um, yeah, and it was only because I was driving, uh, driving my car, I was picking somebody up, I think, from the airport here down in Southampton. And um, when you go to the route to the airport, you go along a certain road and it passes a residential street, which is called Chalk Hill. And um, and there's a signpost, obviously, at the end of the road and it says Chalk Hill. And I thought, oh, Chalk Hill, yeah, that reminds me of that place we used to go and play as kids. And um, yeah, and then it'll just, yeah, there's the start of a song right there. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, just tell me a little bit about Paul Drew. He does the first guitar solo on Chalk Hill. What what uh, led you to that decision? Because you're obviously a very accomplished uh, guitar player. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I've, um, I, I follow a lot of videos on YouTube and a lot of channels on YouTube. It seems to be the modern way these days. Um, we, as as a as a as a Western species, we seem to have left television behind, and everyone's watching YouTube these days. Um, and I found this uh, YouTube channel called the Studio Rats, and it's primarily a channel devoted to um, guitar gear, looking at guitar gear, talking about guitar gear, and reviewing guitar gear. And um, I, I I used to watch all their videos, very informative, good fun as well, and um, great guitar player that was always always demoing all the gear. And um, he actually moved to my area. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't. When I first discovered the channel, he lived near London, um, but he contacted me and he said, "Oh, I'm going to be moving down to um, down your way, not far from you." He said, "Oh, we'll have to hook up," and you know. And I said, "Yeah, that sounds great." And uh, so when he moved, I went round to his house and um, <laughs> little did I know, but he'd actually got a load of guitar gear and he said, oh, do you mind helping out, helping out reviewing some of this stuff? And I said, yeah. So, you know, first time meeting the guy within about half an hour, we were making videos, <laughs> you know, to go up on, on his channel. And, and that's just kind of grown and it's grown and grown over the last sort of two years, I guess. Um, to the point where you know we're kind of good mates now and I, I i link up with him every month or so and we make videos and yeah so when it came to uh recording the album uh, it just felt kind of really natural for me because i really admire his playing um just felt natural to me to just say to him look are you interested in doing me a solo and you know he jumped at it straight away yeah definitely you know because he'd not he's he's been embroiled in this world of youtube now for about five years he hasn't really done much else mm. um he's done a lot of recording in the past but nothing nothing in recent years so he was really up for it um but of course we had to film it as a video <laughs> so you can see if you go to the studio rats channel and just go back i don't know maybe three months or so you can see a video of me and him actually recording the solos, which ended up on the album. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah. yeah. I wondered because uh, again, like I, I've, since I've known you, you have been a guitar player. So I, it, it seemed odd that you would uh, invite someone different to, to play a, a solo on your record. Uh, I mean, Martin Orford's advice, notwithstanding, I mean, you got to take his advice. He's a guy who had John Wetton sing on his records. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, you know, it's nice to, it's nice to get a bit of variation sometimes. And I mean, I know it's only one solo. Um, I think his solo does stick out because he's got a very different style to me. Um, so his solo does stand out, but it stands out in a good way. I think he, he definitely played for the song. So, you know, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm glad he's on the album and, and, and he's happy he is too. So that's great. Now, do you have to learn that solo for a live gig? Yeah, yeah, possibly. Either that or I could invite him to the gig and just say, yeah, get up there and play that bit. <laughs> uh, isolation Disconnection, as you mentioned, this was a, a heavier song. 
It's got Mark mm -hmm. Spencer on vocals. Um, why was Mark the right choice for this particular song? Just because of the style of the song? Yes, it's the delivery of the vocals. He's got a very kind of, um, I want to almost say operatic. I don't know if he, when he watches this, what he'll think of me saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got a very kind of, um, it's not your standard kind of rock delivery. He's got, he's got a, there's a certain vibrato to his voice, which is almost operatic, you know, and he's got a really kind of strong, confident delivery. Um, which I guess he would probably say is contrary to the way he feels because he's very, he's very, he's very unsure about his own performance. I mean, he's a great singer. He's a great bass player. He's a great all round musician. Um, but um, he's always very unsure about his own abilities, which is a real shame because that holds him back sometimes from, you know, doing some things, which I think, you know, would fulfill his, um, his musical career a bit more. Um, you might have picked up from uh, social media if you're connected to him that he's working on a solo album at the moment, which I've been helping him with. Um, and um, and I know he's very grateful to the fact that I keep, you know, I keep pushing him to to get it done because, he, you know, I've listened to bits of it and it sounds really good. I've recorded some guitar for him. He wants me to do a bit more, which, of course, I'm only happy to do. Um, but I keep having to push him. Every time I see him at either a Galahad rehearsal or gig, I'm like, how's the solo album? And he's like... Oh well, you know. No, you need to keep doing it. Keep doing it. You know. <laughs> but yeah, his his vocal delivery, I felt, was just was just perfect for it. Yeah, the songs uh, like it's very crunchy, um, a little bit different musically from the rest of the album. That made me wonder if you had written it at around the same time as some of the other ones, or like, how do you work? Do you have a song bank like Galahad does that you just pull stuff in and out as you? Yeah, as you yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you just it just depends on. I mean, I can I get very influenced by stuff that I hear, obviously. Um, so I could perhaps have just listened to a song by a band that was very similar to that kind of style, and you just kind of think, yeah, I'd love to write a song like that. Let's let's get the guitar out and fire up the fire up the old computer and see what we can come up with. You know, I think um, I think isolation disconnection was probably one of the last songs written for the album, actually. That was written earlier this year, probably about April time, I think. So, okay. Um, it seems to me to be, um, you know, lyrically, you talked about mental health, and and this is clearly about that. But it also seems very personal in terms of, um, a, like it, it seems like it's coming from the perspective of, of a musician who spends a lot of time on stage, and maybe is feeling not connected to the audience, maybe feeling a little bit of of um, alienation from maybe the people that they're playing for. Okay, that's an interesting observation. I mean, this this is the song that's kind of primarily about loneliness mm. um, and just being disconnected. And and I kind of had my own my own mum in mind actually because my mum is um, is is getting on in years now. She's eighty four and uh, she lives alone and um, she's starting to get the uh, the beginnings of uh, dementia, mm. um, which has not been great as you can imagine um, and. And I just kind of wrote it with her in mind, really, about how more disconnected she's getting from the world, really. Mm -hmm. um, I can, she doesn't live far from me. So I make sure that we, I make sure that I visit, you know, three, sometimes four times a week, um, just to go around, see how she is. She has people coming in and helping her at home and stuff as well. So, um, but, um, you know, and because of the dementia, I can have the same conversation with her over and over and over again. <laughs> Uh, and I tell her about things and um, or rather she will tell me about something. And then I'll go around her and see her again. And then I'll, I'll mention to her, oh, well, you, you told me about so and so when I was last here. And she says, oh, what was that I told you then? Because she's forgotten. So she told me something. I then allude to it and she can't remember anything. So then I have to tell her. And I said, the only way I know about this is because you told me last time. <laughs> and it, you get into this bizarre kind of, you know, and I, I just think to myself, how, how disconnected is she from everything? She just she doesn't seem to recall anything. But um, having said that, it doesn't make her. And I've noticed this because I've, I've chatted to a few other people whose parents are starting to stuff, suffer with this as well. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to make them unhappy, but it just seems to make them a little bit kind of bit confused and a bit well it's just forgetfulness really they just yeah. forget everything um but they don't seem unha unhappy about it so i guess that's um something to be uh 
salvaged from it. <laughs> yeah, I imagine that you've talked to Stu about this because Stu has gone through this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, Stu was one of the people that I have spoken to about it. Yeah, so he's going through a similar thing with his dad. Yeah, um, and it's um, yeah, and and it's kind of frightening, really, because it's it's one of those conditions which you know is only going to get worse. Um, and um, yeah, you just kind of fear for what it's going to be like in the future, really. Yeah, but you know, it's life. It is. Um, Hole in the Sky is a five minute song. Mark Atkinson does the vocals on this one. It uh, seems more of an environmentally themed uh, lyrically song. What was on your mind for this one? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but uh, again, as a songwriter, what you tend to do sometimes is when you're writing a song and you're just throwing chords around and seeing what sticks and what works well, you kind of hum. Sometimes, I mean, I don't always do this, but sometimes I might hum along a melody in my head and then you try and find a lyric that fits with that humming that you've done. You know, you sort of go. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, these words just popped into my head. There's a hole in the sky. And I thought, Ooh, where's that suddenly come from? Well, I don't know. But it's yeah, you're right. It sounds as though I'm I'm making some big environmental statement. I'm not really. <laughs> it just tended, it just kind of popped into my head and, and worked well as a lyric. Um, so then the rest of the lyrics just tend to flow from that, really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it sounded like When I Need a Friend, uh, again, Peter Jones uh, returns for vocals on this one. It sounds like this one was written with someone in mind. It sounds like a, a very personal song for you. Is that the case? And if it is, uh, who is this about? No, it's not really written about anyone in particular. This is more to do with the um, the mental health thing. Gotcha. Um, because, um, you know, we're, we're very much encouraged to talk to people, talk to our friends, talk to our family if we can, um, when we're feeling low or when we're feeling sad. Um, so, yeah, I tried, to, uh, I tried to link it in a way that, you know, maybe, you know, your, your partner, your wife, your husband, whatever, um, is probably the best person to talk to because that's the person that knows you best. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you have a good enough relationship with that person that you feel you can talk to them about various things like that, that's probably the best person to talk to. So, but just just making sure that you 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 don't you know getting back to the isolation disconnection bit, I guess. Just make sure that you don't lock yourself away, and and just disappear into yourself, you know, because that's that's not going to be any good for anybody so yeah that's what that song's about really it's it's making sure that you keep the connections with the people that are, you know mean the most to you yeah I'm, I'm glad you brought it up that way because that that's kind of what i was getting at it seemed like it was written for a partner you know so mm. maybe a, a yeah. little little nod to the person that puts up with your hobbies <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah my long-suffering wife yeah, yeah. <laughs> A uh, ten and a half minute epic to close this thing. Oh, but before I move on from that, when I need a friend has a spoken word part in it. Um, tell me mm. about that because that's an interesting uh, thing that you don't hear in a lot of songs. Well, yeah. So that was. I sometimes think. Um, I always find this with concept albums. With concept albums, either the subject matter is so kind of um, lightly stated that you don't understand what it's about. Or it's so overly stated that it's really, really cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, when I was a kid, I used to listen to The Wall by Pink Floyd. I never really understood what it was about. I do now, obviously, but I didn't at the time. Um, and maybe from a younger person's point of view, who perhaps hasn't got the, the you know, the, 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 the life experience yet to understand what these things are about. That's probably why I didn't understand what the wall was about. On the other side of the coin, um, an album called uh, Scenes from a Memory by one of my favourite bands, Dream Theatre, I think the, the the concept of that is too overstated to the point where they're actually talking about newspaper reports and all this kind of stuff. And they actually, you know, they actually recite the lyrics as if they're reading a newspaper about the, the, the thing that the, the album's about, you know. And to me, that get that's overstating it really, and it gets a bit cheesy to my, to my ears. So concept albums and, and 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 getting back to just not necessarily a concept album, but just the subject matter of a song. Um, 
sometimes you can understate it too much that people always say to you, what's that song about? I've, I've got no clue what it's about. And the reason why I put that spoken word part in was because um, I played the song to a few a few people. And um, they said to me, oh, is it a song for your wife? And I said, no, well, kind of, but not really. It's not a love song, really. I didn't want to make it a love song about my wife. Um, it's more a song about mental health. And, and, and one person... <laughs> One person who who is always never backward in coming forward just said to me, "Oh well, I'll never have got that. I oh, I never would have. I ne no no." And so I thought, right, I need to put something obvious in there, <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of get a real kind of understanding of what the song's about. So I did think about maybe getting some, but we're talking right to the almost the night before we mastered the album. This is, I'm thinking, well, I need to do something here, and. Um, and I always think sometimes it's a bit cheesy again when um, uh, the actual person who's the singer or the the main person in the band does a spoken part on the album because you can tell it's them. Mm. Um, and, they, and that's why a lot of people tend to get other people to... I, I didn't have anyone at hand who I could just ask to do this little tiny bit of spoken word. So I, I recorded it myself, so it's my own voice, but I've kind of messed about with it sonically. So um, hopefully it doesn't immediately sound like me <laughs> <laughs> uh, bit of advice probably a good idea to uh let your wife think that it's a love song to her probably is a good idea well i've already written songs about <laughs> okay. her and um on on my colors album there was a, a song called always yours which i got steve overland from fm to sing he's one of our favorite singers between the pair of us so oh, yeah. that's great so that song's for her so and she knows that and uh yeah all right. Well, that's good. Um, so you, this reminded me asking you about the spoken word part reminds me that in the same life, there is a, sounds like a, a news report going in the background. What is mm. that from? Yeah. So that's, um, um, so I picked those up from, um, from sort of public broadcasting. Mm. Hopefully I'm not infringing too many copyrights when I say that I've kept it very low in the mix on purpose. Yeah. It's very hard um, to pick out what it exactly, exactly yeah. is. So, so uh, and there, there was also a part because obviously same life lyrics is about is it's about the ukraine conflict it's about the invasion of ukraine by russia and obviously verse one is is from the point of view of a ukrainian verse two is talking about the man who's currently in charge of russia and um I didn't want to name him by name because I thought that was too obvious. Again, it's too obvious and I didn't want to upset anyone. I didn't want to get into trouble with anyone. <laughs> um, I certainly don't want the KGB knocking at my door. Um, <laughs> well, I don't think they'd knock at the door really, would they? They'd just land Probably on my not. roof. And... You'd never know they were coming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was the same with those news reports. So the news reports are about um, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. Okay. Um, okay. Um, but I, I I thought I'd put them in there low in the mix so that you wouldn't necessarily be able to hear what they were saying, but maybe some really bat-eared people can pick them out. Mm. I can't. My ears have, have lost <laughs> loads of frequencies over the years. I shouldn't say that because I've mixed the album. But there we go. <laughs> <laughs> <But, so, laughs> Um, I think you yeah. still have enough of your faculties to know what you're doing. It's a, it's a it, The album sounds good. It's a, Sonically, it's a very good album. Oh, great. That's good to hear. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's just one of those things where I thought, well, it's it's a good thing to put in there because it's, um, you know, with, with these uh, conflicts and invasions and things, they're always covered heavily by the media. Of course, I'm sure they are in America, just like it is in, in the UK. Seems to be overtaken by the conflict that's now happening between Israel and Lebanon and places now. So we don't hear so much about it. But, um, yeah, it's still in the news a lot. Um, so I thought that was just a good touch to put that in there, really. Yeah. Uh, so 10 and a half minutes, Siren Song is the epic on the album to close things out. Mark mm. Anderson on vocals. Um, and it seems to me, I felt like just reading the lyric sheet, to me, this felt the most metaphorical of the songs on the album. And Definitely. I wasn't really sure what you were going for lyrically because uh, uh, it, it seemed like, you know, you, the, the theme of a, of a siren is to lure you into something that you think it is but it's something else and it's bad for you at the end um what was it that you were thinking about for this 
So uh, as I, I've, as I've alluded to before, it was the music came first. Right. Um, so I, I just actually come back from. So one of the first concerts that I went to after we came, came out of COVID was I went to see Steve Hackett, and um, I'd never seen Steve Hackett before, and I absolutely loved it. It was um, it was when he was doing his uh, Seconds Out tour. Hmm. Um, and it was absolutely fantastic. He was in here in Southampton, so it was a local gig. I didn't have to go far. A couple of the guys from Galahad came with me, um, and it was amazing. I was absolutely blown away. I mean, to the point where, you know, you think about Steve Hackett is 73 now, 74. So he was probably, what, 71, because this was about two or three years ago. And he's still on stage there, absolutely killing it on guitar. He's absolutely amazing. And um, and in between all this, because he constantly seems to be on tour, um, as soon as he finishes one tour, he announces the next one, and it covers another period of Genesis, yeah. and, you know, his solo career. But in between time, he's doing studio albums as well. You know, he's still he's still doing it. You know, it's such such an inspiration. You know, really, because at times, you know, when I think, you know, oh, I'm too busy or I've got too much on or I need to slow things down a bit, and then I think to myself, well, Steve Hackett's way busier than i am and he's 23 years older than me <laughs> so i've got no excuse really anyway i came back from the steve hackett uh gig and and it would really was just an attempt to to create something that was typically prog typically 70s prog sounding um uh, and and possibly in the vein of steve hackett um something that steve steve hackett would record um, so the music came first. So that music came about first. And um, the lyrics came about um, just because I was thinking about, well, because it's a, a, a tribute to proper 70s prog, I've got to, you know, there's this old joke, isn't there, about 70s, about any progressive rock music. Well, that's all music about wizards and goblins and things, isn't it? <laughs> so... Um, so I thought, well, you know, why not? Why not satisfy that particular prog itch and just go for, you know, like you say, lyrics that are, are, are kind of mythical and 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 you know, fantasy lyrics, really. Um, so yeah, Siren, Sirens of the Sea was just kind of something that always stuck with me. I worked with, um, I worked with a guy called Sean Filkins, who was a one guy, one time vocalist with oh, Big yeah. Big Train a few yeah. years ago. Tremendous I, uh, solo album that he put out a few years. Yeah, ago. Yeah, well, I, I worked on that with yeah. with Sean. I, I helped him produce it and did a lot of the guitars and things on it. And he he had a similar song on there. I think that was called Sirens of the Sea or something. And um, yeah, so he introduced me to that concept of what Sirens of the Sea was all about. Yeah, all those years ago. So it's just a kind of a it's it's a nod to that really it's an extension of that. Gotcha, yeah. Um, it it I had to smile there in the middle because when you told me you were going for a Steve Hackett type song, this is a very uh, there's a lot of Steve Hackett stuff that kind of starts out a little slow and then picks up the pace and in the, about just shy of about six minutes in, you got the thing picks up the pace and it goes kind of takes a right turn. It almost goes into a little bit of a gallop, doesn't it, for a few minutes? Mm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I should have listened to the album before we chatted, actually, because I've not listened to it since we mastered <laughs> it, which was getting on for two months ago. <laughs> so I'm going to be doing a few of these interviews where people say, oh, yeah, tell me about that bit in the middle. And I'm thinking, oh, God, how does that go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, understood. Because, you know, normally when I do these, it, I'm talking to people that they've already they're already recording their next record. And, the you know, the, the thing that we're talking about is something that they finished eight months ago. Mm. Yeah. like inside out or some other record company is just now putting it out but to them they already turned the page they haven't listened to it recently either so yeah. uh, i get it and i also i get exactly what you're saying about steve hackett because i got to see him uh, a few months ago on the foxtrot at 50 tour but he was also touring his latest album uh, circus and the night whale mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, just he he right he's brilliant in fact uh, my michael's record collection twitter that's my um my wallpaper or whatever you call it my feature image on my uh, account so um because i i sprung for good tickets for that one so i could sit up front and in the middle and see everything and big fan of jonas reingold on bass too as well so uh i totally get it so here we are you got your 10th album it's coming out um 
you you've got a Lee Abraham band. How many shows do you think you might be able to do to support this record? Um, I'd like to do a few more. Actually, we've got one. We've got an album launch show which is happening in February next year. Um, so that was supposed to be happening in September this year. So it should have happened by now. But we were so into you know recording the album that I just couldn't say to the guys you know. Oh, and we need to rehearse for a gig as well. You know, it just would have been too much of a bigger ask, you know. So I had a word with the guy who's promoting the gig. It's at a local venue here in Southampton called the 1865, which is a fantastic venue. And, um, yeah, I said to the guy, I said to the promoter, um, any chance we could postpone this gig till early 25? And, um, you know, he he was so pleased with the way that the gig went last year that we did there. He was only too happy to help. So uh, he found us a slot for February, which was great. So so I'm kind of treating it as an album launch because the album would have only been out three, four months at that time. Um, and I'll, I'll have copies with me, which is nice because people always say that, you know, will there be copies of the album at the gig? You know, and it's it, the worst thing you can say is, oh, well, no, because it's not quite finished yet. Or, you know, <laughs> people just go, ah, oh, well, <laughs> not interested then you know but if you say well yes it's an album launch gig we'll have copies there you know and we're, we're going to be playing two or three songs from the album as well you know so hopefully it's going to be a great night um but um yeah just to say the 1865 um i just have to give it a plug because it's a fantastic venue that we've got here in southampton i've played there numerous times over the last over the years i've played there three or four times with galahad now i've done a couple of solo spots I've I've um, done a few um, support slots. That's the term I'm looking for. Um, so I supported Frank Carducci there, um, just doing solo. I just played a, a 30 minute set, just the backing tracks, you know, which tends to go down quite well. The headline bands always like that when there's a solo guy doing the support slot because it's just one person, you know. It's not a full band where there's like, you know, there's more people in the support band than there are on the headliners, you know. <laughs> Um, but it's hard um, for you to blow them off the stage when it's that way. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. That's always the danger, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so a fantastic and and as a as a as a punter, I've seen over the over the last year alone at that venue, I've seen Spock's Beard, I've seen the Flower Kings, um, and numerous other bands as well, prog bands as well. Um, Fish played there uh, last year. I think he's playing there as part of his farewell tour. Um, yeah, so it's it's a, a arena. Mustn't forget my chums in arena. I saw arena there a few years ago. So uh, you know it's a fantastic venue, and it's putting on some not only um, gigs of all types of different genres. It's really putting on some great progressive rock bands as well. Yeah, that's just an embarrassment of riches. I, I'm I'm in a prog desert here in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> we get a few shows here and there, but yeah, we don't we don't get that that kind of a lineup just constantly coming through. So. Uh, Lee, where's the best place for people to buy this record and, and maybe uh, hear some samples? Yeah, so I need to put together a showreel. I haven't done it yet. I was going to do it for early October, but just time has run away with me. Um, but I will put out a showreel before it's released officially, um, which will be on YouTube. And it will also be on my um, Facebook page as well. So people can connect. I, I do have an official Lee Abraham Music Facebook page, but... People can just connect with me personally. They can find me on Facebook. You know, um, I've got, I've got no problem with people connecting with me on my personal page. Um, makes my life easier because then I only have one page to update them. Um, but um, yeah, so on, find me on Facebook, find me on YouTube. Um, but the best place to buy the album and order the album from is from progrock.co.uk. Okay. All right. Well, follow uh, follow Lee on Facebook and, uh, and go pick out the new record, uh, Origin of the Storm. This is, uh, I know it, it seems hyperbolic to say it. It's just come out. I've listened to it six times. This might be my favorite thing that you've done. And that's saying something because I've, I've enjoyed your music through the years all the way back to View from the Bridge. Oh, wow. Crikey, that's even, going back. Even pictures in the hall, actually. Oh, crikey. <laughs> <laughs> Over 20 years ago. Yeah. All right. Oh, that's great. That's great to hear. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, no problem. Lee, thank you so much for your time for telling me about this record. I hope it does really well for you and uh, best of luck with it. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time.